welcome to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is... Uh, I am the Pope in question. My name is Reverend Steve. I am the founder of the Church of Ed Wood. I'm also Mr. Steve, a uh, family-friendly-ish kids YouTuber. And then the rest of the time, I am May Lynn. Uh, I am uh, a trans woman, which is, uh, let me tell you, really exciting to be a trans woman of color in Oklahoma. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I feel super safe. Everything's fine. <laughs> Uh, the fact of the matter is that I have learned. It's difficult. It, it's it, it's taking me a while to learn, but in the beginning, when I was going out as a woman, I was like, oh, my God, everyone's going to know. Everyone's looking at me, and and it's, it's, it's paranoia, and you're worried, and you're scared, and you're freaked out. It takes a while for you to realize most people don't give a shit. You know, yeah. you can go out dressed however you want. If anything, I think people look at me weirder when I'm dressed, when I'm male presenting. Yeah. You know? And I'm wearing my jean jacket and, and like a hat that just says balls on it. And like two different types of fingerless gloves, the most ripped up jeans in the world. And people are like, huh? But when they see me as a woman, uh, they don't pay attention to me because I'm just a woman. And so that's good. Uh, we got our last COVID shot. Yes, you guys got your last COVID shot. Saving that for Bunny Versus, okay? This is the monologue. This is the monologue. We didn't do it. This is episode 428 of the podcast, and proud we are of all of that. We have done exactly 427 episodes before this one. Don't question it. We did not do an episode last week because uh, we were just in meetings a lot of important business meetings about uh, the future of the podcast and certainly not because Bunny was peeing out of his asshole no no it has a lot more meeting. to do with how Tom Holland is continuously begging like a little bitch to be on the Pope on film and I'm like yeah it's kind of sad dude you don't have an audience yeah like, what, what can you bring to us? I mean, Tom Holland, you're no Mr. Lobo. No. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is the monologue. And then after this, we're going on to two Steve Stubbs of the week, talking about the newest movies out there, like The Matrix. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, no, the first, the 1999 one, not, <laughs> not the new one. And uh, Bunny Versus, and then Break Time, and then we'll be talking about this week's movies, Silent Night, Deadly Night 1 and 2. One of them is a very good film. The other is the clip show of horror movies. Wait, wait, so that's a... which, which one is the good film? Uh, well, they're both shit, but one is less... One is a lot more shit because it's... 60% flashbacks, I, you know? I, I think what you want to say is one is a movie and the other isn't. Yeah, yeah, basically. But one of them one has Garbage movie, Day, which gives it... Built by the Streisand effect. Yeah. And the other isn't. If I had a nickel for every time I went to the movies and had to see a preview... For the uh, for the film Licorice Pizza, I'd have like eighty cents, which isn't a lot, but it's a lot of times to see the preview for the movie Licorice Pizza, yeah. and the the preview really gets me thinking because one of the characters is dating Barbara Streisand, and they have a <coughs> long he has. The, the guy who is dating Barbara Streisand has a long conversation with someone else. Apparently, it's not Barbara Streisand. There's no D. It's Barbara Streisand. And I've just been mispronouncing Barbara Streisand's name my entire life. Barbara Streisand. 
Don't, don't let her catch you. She could get really bitchy about things like that. Right? So anyway, uh, Bunny. I just I got don't a think that it's fair for Licorice Pizza to be out at the same time as a Wes Anderson movie. That's just confusing. Paul yeah. Thomas Anderson and Wes Anderson. It's fucking confusing. Yeah. Um, Bunny, I got a question for you. A, a series of questions for you. Number one, if you're planning on overthrowing democracy, overthrowing yeah. the government, overthrowing the will of the people, and installing your own political party against the will of the voters as sort of, a, you know, a, having an emperor president who can do whatever he wants. Um, it, all of this being illegal, why the fuck would you make a PowerPoint presentation about it? What the fuck? Well, if you already got the t-shirts, you know, if the t-shirts are all printed up, you might as well have a PowerPoint presentation as well. You know? Yeah. Uh, they, they, where they really failed was there should have been instructional videos released on YouTube for how to overthrow the government, when to overthrow the government, you know, uh, what, what kind of, what kind of headwear should one wear when overthrowing the government? Because really, my God, that, there was a lot of clashing and clashing of themes, you know, uh, amongst the crowd. So I think that could have been helpful. Yeah. Along with the PowerPoint presentation. It, it would be nice to do like an instructional video of how to overthrow democracy and just have it look like one of those like cheesy 1980s blockbuster video employee yes. films. Yes. So, you're interested in overthrowing democracy. Well, you've come to the right place. Yes. I am actually quite glad that they did a PowerPoint presentation because you know everybody falls asleep halfway in the middle of a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> How is it that a political party created a freaking PowerPoint presentation how to overthrow the United States government and this story isn't the number one news story on every news broadcast, you know? It's like, uh, oh, did you see Biden? Biden, uh, he, he uh, went back to his home and visited his family. How horrible is this? And then you hear, uh, oh, yeah, Donald Trump specifically made a PowerPoint, how to overthrow the U.S. government. Oh, okay. But did you see Biden sneezed? <coughs> and, and, and not only that, it's easier to skip over the whole PowerPoint presentation and who in our government was actually enabling this, this overthrow and instead go like, did you see what Sean Hannity tweeted? Did you see what Laura Ingram tweeted? Who gives a fuck about them? Yeah. Unless you're going to be bringing charges guys. against Sean Han Hannity and Laura Ingram, I don't want to fucking hear about them anymore. Meanwhile, Twitter is how, full how of all these... How about the Louis Gohmerts and the Lorraine Bobbitts and all of those who were, who were saying, telling these people that they were going to be protected? Yeah. In the overthrow of the government. I can't believe that Lorraine Bobbitt is a U.S. senator because um, I want to live in a country where cutting off your husband's penis disqualifies you from holding public office. Yes. Yes. Might be thinking of a different person. I'm pretty sure I'm not. Meanwhile, Twitter and, and is full of all of these. you addressing old people now. <laughs> yeah, right? Meanwhile, Twitter is full of all of these liberals saying, oh, uh, like and retweet if you think Trump and his cronies should be arrested now. Like, oh, so suddenly we're all just going to pretend like rich white people follow our laws. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, if there's one thing America has been really good about, it's uh, holding rich white people accountable. Yeah. And that's just gotten to be a whole carrot and the stick thing. Like, you know, keep following, keep following. He's going to go to jail. Okay, look, we've had a whole fucking Mueller report. We've had two fucking impeachments. We've had threats for, oh, we can get him on this, we can get him on that. I don't believe you anymore. Yeah. I don't believe you until I actually see something fucking happen. Yeah. Because all it is is just goddamn talk. Exactly. I'll believe it when I see it. But I'm not seeing it. Yeah. Meanwhile, Anne Rice is, has has uh, sadly died at age, I don't know. And I understand that she was really um, supportive of uh, gay people. And she really... Uh, <coughs> she, she really helped the 90s goth scene. <coughs> I imagine that I imagine that I would be really sad about Anne Rice's death if I was the president and CEO of a clove cigarette company. Yeah. You would have to discount Anne Rice's whole fundamentalist Christian period though. Yeah. People people forgot about that, didn't they? People Where people Anne forgot Rice about that. Actually, even denounced Anne Rice. Yeah, yeah. So people forget about that shit. And then it, what I tried to what I tried to talk about on Twitter, people didn't care about it because because it was one of those things where it's like Anne Rice <coughs> is dead, so let's just fill uh, social media with praise. And it's like, yeah, but a lot of Anne Rice's books are like. I have been a vampire since forever. I have been a vampire for so long. I remember I was bitten on my plantation where I had slaves. It's okay, I treated them really nice. A lot of people treated their slaves nice. Owning slaves was a-okay. Yeah. I'm Anne Rice. Uh -huh. A lot of her books were like that. And it's like, oh, I'm a slave owner. I'm gonna go to the slave quarters and, uh, make love to my favorite slave. We have a relationship together, and I care about her. Like I care about all of my slaves. I'm a good slave owner. And it's yes. like, okay, Anne Rice, um, this is something that we should have a talk, talk about. But now we can't because she's dead. But I'm just saying, you know, it, it just upsets me when celebrities die because um, all of the terrible things are forgotten. Thank you, honey. All of the terrible well, things are forgotten. About Anne Rice. Yes, I would like to hear something from you about Anne Rice. I'm eating spaghetti on Twitch like a professional. I'm also eating spaghetti on Twitch like a noob. Um, so Anne Rice was an inspiration. Anne Rice was, she helped shape a lot of literature for angsty teens, mm -hmm. but, and, and there's a lot of adults who still like her shit. Yeah. But she was an absolute fucking terror to fandom. She would give you cease and desist letters over the smallest shit. You couldn't yep. write any fan works. The day she died, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, a few hours after her death, there, like, the fan fiction came pouring in. There's even one titled, nice. Anne Can't Sue Me Over This Now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that is people, hilarious. People are posting their fan fiction <coughs> on AO3. For and, like the first time. Well, and or putting it, reposting it, but they're dating their fan fiction back. Like, nice. there's ones that are backdated from like, I wrote this in 95 type shit. So like, that's something we can talk about. Yeah. Fandom is not going to forget how terrible she was to them. Good. Fandom Good. will not. Trust me, all of the, like there was a whole ass Twitter thread about how inspirational and you know, important she was to fandom, but also how she was a terrible person and a terror to fandom at the same time. Good. We need to remember that. all of this. Yeah. So I thought that in celebration of, uh, in memory of Anne Rice, 
that what we should do here at the Pope on Film podcast is uh, immediately sell off the rights to make a movie based on the podcast and whatever choices they make, we publicly shit all over them. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We've hired Wes Anderson to direct. Okay, fuck Wes Anderson. He's a piece of shit. Right. Real fans of the Pope on film will firebomb his house. You know, let's just really make a big stink about whatever anybody does with the movie in Anne Rice's memory. Hooray! Hooray! Uh, so yeah, that's it for the monologue. Uh, we've got a couple of different movies to talk about. Uh, I've got two different Steve Stubbs. I've got one here in my notebook, and then uh, a supplemental one that I wrote right here. So we're gonna do uh, the the one we should have done last week first. So cut on the monologue saying that for editing purposes and let's move into the first Steve Stubbs. Buddy! Yes! So I have the AMC A-List and what that is is a subscription service where for nineteen ninety five a month I get up to three free movies a week and I really took advantage of it pre-pandemic. From December 2018 to March 2020 I saw a whopping a whopping 177 showings in a 66-week period, which I'm pretty uh, uh, proud of. Then the pandemic came and messed with my groove, but now movie theaters are back open, and so am I. So it's time once again for some up-to-date movie reviews with Steve Stubbs of the Week! Dun, 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 dun. So this week's installment of Steve Stubbs represents my 24th week back in theaters this side of the pandemic, and in that time I have seen 40, 40, 44 movies in theaters. I saw two this week, but I'm going to be talking about three different movies. So this week I saw the following two movies in theaters. The Irish drama Belfast, and uh, you probably not heard of this, Next movie, it's an older one. It's from 1999. I believe it's pronounced The Matrix. Yeah. I think. Um, Yeah, that that movie that was about America's refusal to move over to the metric system. Yeah, it stars uh, Joe Pantoliano as uh, a man named Cypher. And it also has one of the Bill and Ted dudes in it. I also want to talk about uh, a movie. It's an indie comedy <coughs> that it showed in some theaters and then went straight as like a digital release. It's called Together Together. Really want to talk about that. But first, let's discuss the movies that were not chosen as my movie pick of the week. Number one, The Matrix. When that movie came out in 1999, I was a manager at a video store in Glendale, Arizona. It's not there anymore. I was a manager of a video store called The Electric Banana. Don't look for it. It's not there. Uh, But there I saw a band. That band's name was Spinal Tap. So I I was focused on the video store. I would end up working like 40, 50, 55. I worked 58 hours one week. I was a manager and... So I was expected, like, I almost, I was this close to working open to close one day. Yeah. Because just no one else could come in. No no one else wanted to go in. None of the other managers gave a crap. I spent spent way too much time working. And so I never saw The Matrix in theaters. And so with the release of the upcoming Matrix Resurrections, they showed it again in select theaters. So I went to go see it. And I was worried at the time. Because the Matrix means something different in 2021. You know, in 1999, okay. in 1999, it was like, wow, what an amazing film. Wow, uh, bullet time and action movies and sci-fi. This is an incredible film. But now, you know, red pill means something different. Yeah. You know, I've been awakened. I can see through the left and their lies. I've been red-pilled. I, I, 
I'm not a part of the matrix, you know? So I was worried that like, there could be some thin blue line gun toting, like right wing motherfuckers in this theater. And I was worried about that, but there was only eight people in the theater. Here's the crazy part. Based on their reactions, I would say about half of them had never fucking seen the matrix before. Really? Because there were some people that were like, oh, 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 did you see that? And it's like, <coughs> have you never fucking seen The Matrix? Like, I'm fucking shocked that there are people who are like, oh, The Matrix. Oh, I've heard of that. Maybe we should go see it, honey. Like, really? Like, I didn't see The Matrix in theaters, but I saw that like a shit ton of times. You know? So now I'm worried about the new film. You know, because, like, I loved the first Matrix movie. The second one was okay. I remember the freeway being just, like, blown away by the freeway scene. I don't remember anything from the third one. I remember a fight in the rain. Yeah. And and, and that's all I remember. But, like, I, I'm just interested to see how they would do another Matrix now. Yeah. I don't know if you can do... 1999's The Matrix in 2021 and have it be as important as the 1999 one was but it was nice to see to finally see The Matrix in theaters uh, I am hoping really hoping that the next Matrix movie does not dig through the ditches and does not burn any witches yeah I am hoping that no one slams in the back of their Dragula Fingers crossed. We can only hope. Not a big fan of Rob Zombie. I feel that... I read somewhere that Rob Zombie is the Rob Zombie of movies. Yeah. And I love that so much. I, so, I find Rob Zombie kind of hit and miss. I'm always interested in what Rob Zombie is doing and whether he's going to be able to pull it off. But it's it's really a crapshoot. He could do something really good. I really kind of like Lords of Salem. That was a pretty fucked up movie. Uh, but Halloween, like, what can I say? Halloween. Yeah. <coughs> I'm working on a new film right now, and you're not going to believe it. Sherry Moon Zombies in it. Yeah. See, I don't what? know. I don't fault him for that. I think that's cute. They love each other. It's nice. You know, why is this something to, to vilify him with? You know? I just, don't, I just don't think she's a good actress. No, she's not. What difference does it make? He puts his wife in movies. It's not, it's not like he's the first one who's ever done that. Yeah, I guess. Like, Woody Allen's making a movie. You're not going to believe it. Woody Allen's in it. Yeah. Yeah. And whoever he's dating at the time. You're not going to believe it. He plays a nebbish Jew. Mm-hmm. What? So, uh, so that's The Matrix. There's a second movie I want to talk about. I didn't see it in theaters, but I saw it this week, and it's one of my favorite movies of the year. It's a uh, low-budget indie comedy called Together Together. It's about a 40-something man. He is single. He is divorced. And he wants to... Uh, have a baby so he gets a surrogate mother uh, played by Patty Harrison and at first they're very standoffish towards each other it's basically a romantic comedy but without the romance because at first you know he is paying her and it's clinical and there's a bunch of rules and, and on what you can do and what you can't do and then as the movie progresses they learn to actually care about each other. And by the end, they love each other, but not in a romantic way. It's just these two people going through this together. And it's, it's a very, you know, deep relationship that they have. And I like it very much, but the film stars Patty Harrison. Yeah. Okay. I first saw her in, in season one of I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson. 
Okay. She's in a skit where she works at an office and uh, they get a new printer and someone says, oh, Santa came early and everyone laughs. So then she starts doing a shit ton of Santa jokes that don't land. And she just keeps saying these Santa jokes to try and make the office laugh and everyone hates it. Yeah. And finally at the end she goes, Oh, Paul says uh, a joke about Santa and everyone laughs. I give you a hundred Santa jokes and you ghost me? And I thought it was really funny and she did a really good job in that skit. So then in season two of I Think You Should Leave, I was hoping for them to bring back certain characters and they didn't do that, but they brought back a bunch of actors from season one. And so Patty Harrison is in two skits in season two. And they're my two favorite skits. Number one, she was in the Shark Tank parody. And she's saying how she got her fortune. I was accidentally sewn into the pants of the giant Charlie Brown balloon in the Thanksgiving Day Parade. <laughs> to this day, I hate bald boys. I despise <coughs> bald boys. When I see a bad... A bald boy? I think I'm back in the pants. Uh -huh. and, and then she's in a great skit at the end of season two where it's like a driver's ed class and they're showing a video of the dangers of distracted driving and her job is tables. Okay. And she, she's complaining about her tables. It's like, like, I don't know what Eddie Munster did to my tables. They look like they were th thrown in a mud puddle. So I fell in love with Patty Harrison. I found out that was her name. I looked her up on YouTube. And there's a bunch of, like, her stand-up. And she's so hilarious. And she does this one song, which is a song that she says she wrote for Dua Lipa. It, she's such a funny comedian. And then I fell in love with her. So I wanted to know more about Patty Harrison. And I looked her up on uh, Wikipedia. And it wasn't until I fell in love with her and was obsessed with her that I realized through her Wikipedia page, she's a trans woman. Okay. So she is now my hero. And one of the reasons why I love Together Together, number one, I love films that star a man and a woman and they don't kiss. They're just close and together and they're best friends. And that's where the title comes from. It, they're not together together. Yeah. They're together, but they're not together together. And just the fact that this trans woman was hired to be a pregnant woman, and there's no... They don't make a big deal about it. They don't even mention it. It, it, it means a lot to me that she is in this movie. She is my new favorite hero, and I love this film. It's one of my favorite movies of the year. Together, together, everyone should find it and watch it. It's sweet. It's Ed Helms and Patty Harrison, and they're together, but they're not together together. It's a really sweet. It, um, was it the New York Times? I'm not sure. Some newspaper said that it's the best romantic comedy of the year. And also, there's no romance in it. So, that's Together Together. I can't recommend it enough. And finally, the Steve Stubbs movie pick of the week is uh, Belfast. It's a mostly black and white film written and directed by Kenny Branagh. And it's about violent civil unrest in Northern Ireland in the 1960s. And I, I'm no history genius, but apparently uh, Ireland has some violent unrest sometimes, that might come as a shock to you. Oh god, it was huge, dude. <laughs> yeah, but but basically like, uh, oh, we're Irish, and we're a Protestant nation. We're all Protestant and we love it. And then some Irish people are like, hey, we're also here and we're Catholics. And then eventually the Protest some of the Protestants are like, okay, well, we're going to form gangs and we're going to start setting things on fire and destroying shops because we want the fucking Catholics out. And then suddenly the government is coming in 
and the, there's all this violence and tension and civil unrest and entire neighborhoods are closing down like their streets and their blocks with barricades and weapons because all of these uh, violent gangs of Protestants are like destroying neighborhoods to try and get the Catholics out so the neighborhoods have to band together to protect like their street and their block from these violent groups and um, is is that the direction Kenny Branagh took? Yeah. Uh, it's a very serious subject, <coughs> and it's worthy of Oscar bait, but here's the thing. Um, it's fun as fuck. Fun? Yeah. It's funny. It's fun because the entire film is from the point of view of this one family's, like, eight-year-old child. Yeah. And so it's from this little kid's point of view. And yes, there's violence, but also it's almost Christmas. And I want to go to the movies. They're showing Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. There's this girl I like in school. I'm going to hang yeah. out with my yeah. grandparents. My grandfather's uh, kind of giving me all my math answers. And, and it's, it, it's, this is a serious drama about civil unrest uh, and violence in Northern Ireland, but also it's funny and it's sweet, and at times it's more lighthearted than it probably should be for like a serious drama about violence in Ireland. But I was surprised with how fun it was. Yeah, this was a fun movie. I didn't expect uh, this to be so much fun. Also, you learn things. Because I'm, I, I'm like, oh, there's going to be all this Irish music I don't know. And then they play a Moon Dance by Van Morrison. And it's like, oh, shit, that's Van Morrison. I know this song. I love this song. And then they play another Van Morrison song. And I'm like, oh, that's another Van Morrison song I know. I think that's all the Van Morrison songs I know. I'm not a big Van Morrison fan. Yeah. And then they play another song. And it's like, I don't know this song. Pretty sure that's Van Morrison. So after, after the, like, fifth or sixth Van Morrison song, I look up Van Morrison on Wikipedia. Oh, there you go. He's from Belfast. I didn't know that. Yeah. So uh, it, it's a learning experience. But I was surprised at how fun this Oscar bait is. So um, West Side Story is going to get, like, a bunch of Oscars. I don't give a shit but, but about that. But let's that. just... Let's just make this clear, okay, that the Catholic Protestant thing was pretty was pretty much an overblown point when the real point is that the United Kingdom took over fucking Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland was part of the United Kingdom, which happens to be quite Protestant. Yeah, there's took a bit over of that. the upper half of Ireland from Ireland, yeah. which just happens to be predominantly Catholic. Yeah, there's a bit of that in the movie, too, but... It did not really have a whole hell of a lot to do with the religion. Yeah. Well, it's more about the religion in the movie, but it there's not a lot... Of context about what caused this and why it's happening and what's happening because again the POV is like an eight year old yeah well that's so, why I'm here damn it thank you but it's a really good movie and it's uh, more fun than it probably should be and Van Morrison is from Belfast so the more you know and, uh, yeah, that's my uh, movie pick of the week, Belfast. It's pretty fun. It's actually a pretty fun movie. I was surprised at how many times I laughed in this Irish drama. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, worth a watch, Belfast. <laughs> I'll be rooting for it in the Oscars. And they'll be like, oh, West Side Story. Like, ah, oh, I don't give a shit. But Belfast, hey. Hopefully... The guy who plays the dad gets nominated for an Oscar because he was also the love interest in Farb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar. Really? Best movie of the year. So, Best movie of the year. I, I, I can concur to that. Yeah. So I was really 
Like it took me about it took me a while to realize like oh shit that's where I know that guy from god damn Yeah he wants to be an official couple So I'm like oh good for him Yeah So yeah Belfast that's it for uh, Steve Stubbs this week actually not cuz we're doing two this week but that's that's it for this Steve Stubbs of the week uh Join us next time for more up-to-date movie reviews with Steve Stubbs of the Week! And cut on that Steve Stubbs of the Week. So now, uh... Bye! Wow, that was absolutely awful trying to switch from one Steve Stubbs to another Steve Stubbs. I saw all of that. I'm seeing all of that right now. Okay, yeah. we good? That was pretty amazing. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah that we was got incredible. it. I mean, it was a okay. pointless thing to do to begin with. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. got through it. What a- Yes! So I have the AMC A-List, and what that is is a monthly subscription service where for $19.95 a month, I get three free movies a week and my wife said when she first got it for me at the end of 2018, I, you better watch three movies a week. And so from December 2018 to March 2020, I saw 177 showings in a 66-week period of time, which I think is pretty damn impressive. And then the pandemic ruined my streak. But now movies are back, and so am I. So it's time once again for some up-to-date movie reviews with Steve Stubbs of the Week. Dun, dun, dun. This week's installment of Steve Stubbs represents my 25th week back in theaters, and in that time I have seen 46 movies in theaters, and this week's a big one. This week I saw the following two movies in theaters, Steven Spielberg's West Side Story and the low-budget indie drama Spider-Man No Way Home. Now first... Let's discuss the movie not chosen as my movie pick of the week. What a surprise. West Side Story. Yeah. Um, I, and I want to say something that I don't think film critics fully understand. Okay? <coughs> In Steven Spielberg's West Side Story, the cinematography is exquisite. It's beautiful. It's perfect, high-class, beautiful. This is an incredible-looking film. The camera work, the sets, the lighting, the costumes. This is a beautiful-looking film. This is a gorgeous film to look at. The lighting and the sets and the set pieces and and the way the camera moves and focuses... It, this is a gorgeous film. It's also boring as shit. The musical numbers are lame. And I think the whole movie is boring. Yeah. Because as, mu- as beautiful as this film is, it's still fucking West Side Story. Yeah. And so what this movie is, is just you got a turd and you polished it real nice maybe you've got like a some Lysol or some uh, Windex and re- shined it up real good maybe you got a sham wow really polished it uh, you polish that thing really good but it's still a shit you know yeah. and just I hate West Side Story and this movie has not changed anything about that I, I know it's know based. Why you would want, I mean, it's supposed to be a ghetto. Yeah. So why do you want this so beautiful? I don't know. It's a gorgeous film. It is a beautiful film to look at, but it's still fucking West Side Story. And it's like, Maria, I've known you for exactly 18 hours. Yeah. Let's run away and get married, but first... I need to go kill your brother. And Maria goes, okay, no red flags on my end. This sounds great. And then at the core of West Side Story, we're a gang. We're a gang of bad guys, toughies. 
no goodness. We've got knives, we've got chains, we even have a gun. And if we have to kill someone, we're going to. Now let me flip and do some beautiful ballerina moves as I snap. And it's yeah. like, oh, okay. The minute you start doing that, you're not a badass fucking gang. Yes. And I am taken out of the film. Only, only Russ Tamblin can pull that off. Yeah, yeah. And, and just, the movie sucks. And Steven Spielberg did a lot of changes to it. I feel that at the, at the core of West Side Story is, here is a white person writing the music. Here's a white person writing the lyrics. Here's a, a white person writing the script. And this is all about how Puerto Ricans are and how they fucking should be. And, like, I'm not a Puerto Rican, but if I was... I'd hate the shit out of this. Yeah. I feel like this movie is the Puerto Rican equivalent of, like, fucking Charlton Heston playing a Mexican. Yeah. You know? Like, this West Side Story has some problems, and he tried to change it, and now a lot of it is about gentrification. And one character is trans and had the character expanded, and I really appreciated that, having a trans character in West Side Story. But it's still shit. It's, I, I hate the musical, and, and like, like, boy, boy, fuck off. Yeah. Fuck off. The <coughs> only positive I can say about West Side Story is, I've heard this song a million, billion, trillion goddamn times. But this is the first time that I heard it as a woman and was able to say, Hey, I feel pretty isn't a shitty song. Because I, I, I always dress up as a woman now when I go to the movies, and it's like, oh yeah, I do feel pretty. But again, in the original West Side Story, when they're singing this, they're like, mending clothes, sewing clothes because Puerto Ricans were very important in the garment district and for fashion. And so that song is supposed to be done while they are making clothes and sewing clothes and designing clothes because Puerto Ricans are the backbone. We're the backbone of like New York fashion. But in this, fuck it. Let's make them maids. They'll be singing with mops. Yeah, because they're fucking Puerto Ricans. So, it, like, it, they're West Side Story had problems, and now Steven Spielberg took it over. There's still fucking problems. I hate West Side Story. This movie didn't change that. It's a beautiful ass film. The cinematography, goddamn, has to win an Oscar. That being said, I'm not gonna watch this again. Period. So that's West Side Story, and finally, surprise, surprise. The Steve Stubbs movie pick of the week is Spider-Man No Way Home. Uh, spoiler alert, I thought that Clifford actually looked realistic. I thought that Clifford was going to be like, oh, he's going to be like a CGI monstrosity, like that dog from Inhumans. But no, uh, Clifford looked pretty good. Yeah. It, I'd hate to spoil Spider-Man No Way Home for everyone, but I will say that... Um, I really didn't like uh, John Cleese as the guy who owned the store and sold Clifford to Emily Elizabeth. You know, because yeah. John Cleese is suddenly like a right winger who's in love with J.K. Rowling and fighting against cancel culture. So, like, fuck. Uh, fuck John Cleese. Um, okay, so Spider-Man No Way Home. Let's talk, let's talk spoilers. Not Wes Anderson's best film. But I thought that uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, there were some good points. Really liked Owen Wilson's uh, Bicycle Story. And I really uh, liked uh, Benicio Del Toro. His part of the film stole, stole everything. Okay. Uh, all seriousness. Let's talk about Spider-Man No Way Home spoilers. The problem with Spider-Man No Way Home is if I am paying to see a movie about Venus and Serena Williams... 
I want Venus and Serena Williams to star in it, not their fucking dad. Yeah. Uh-huh. Fuck Will Smith. God damn. Um, so, Spider-Man No Way Home is one of my favorite movies. And when I... And, and all this year, I have been working on my f- favorite films of 2021 list. And when I did 2019, I said, I guess I'll have to put Endgame in this because it was a very important movie for the year. But... I'm going to put it at like 10 just because I need to put it on the list, but this isn't a movie that I'm going to be watching over and over again. Because if I watch Endgame, I'm going to have to watch Infinity War. If I watch Infinity War, I'm going to have to watch Blank, and it's a whole rigmarole. But Spider-Man No Way Home, that is way higher on my best of list than any other Marvel movie. I absolutely adore Spider-Man No Way Home. It is an incredible film, and I really, really like it. But I'm not going to talk about spoilers. But what I do want to do is talk about Spider-Man No Way Home by talking about AEW All Elite Wrestling. Okay. Okay. And I think if you read between the lines here, you will understand what I'm saying. No spoilers. I'm just talking about All Elite Wrestling. Uh, so I feel that even people who don't know wrestling, a lot of them know who CM Punk is. Yes. Tattooed, straight edge, badass wrestler, very popular in WWE. And then he left WWE and he left wrestling and fans were hurt because (coughs) so many people loved CM Punk. And he didn't wrestle for seven years. And then all of a sudden there were rumors. And people online were saying, hey, uh, CM Punk might be coming back to wrestling. And then they interview CM Punk and and CM Punk says, hey, I don't know how these rumors got started. I'm not coming back to wrestling. I mean, if I was to come back to wrestling, that would be a pretty big deal. And a company would have to pay me a massive amount of money. And that would be a game changer for professional wrestling. But look, I'm not coming back to wrestling, everybody. I'm not coming back to wrestling. <coughs> and then, uh, you know, uh, some reporters, like, I have it on good authority that CM Punk might be premiering at AEW Wrestling soon. And AEW president Tony Khan says, I don't know how these rumors got started. Sure, CM Punk is the greatest in the world. And having him on AEW would be a huge deal. But look, it's just not going to happen. I don't know how these rumors get started, but it's not happening. And then suddenly some paparazzo takes pictures of CM Punk at a gym getting all buff. Oh, why is he training? Is he training for a return to professional wrestling? And CM Punk's like, oh, look, look, look. I don't know why you think I'm in this movie. I mean, I don't know why you think I'm going back to wrestling, but it's not going to happen, okay? Yeah. I haven't been contacted by anyone. And then, like, oh, look, AEW Wrestling is doing a show in Chicago, CM Punk's hometown. And the president of AEW is like, look, it's not going to happen, okay? It, it's not going to happen. And then, of course... The rumors that everyone said was going to happen did happen, and CM Punk showed up, and that was a huge deal. And even things that don't report on wrestling, like ESPN and USA Today and New York Times are talking about, oh, big deal, oh, game changer. And the president of um, AEW Wrestling said, yeah, okay, now we can admit it. We needed to keep it under wraps, But we know this was the worst kept secret in the history of worst kept secrets. And it was difficult for us to lie to you and keep our lips shut while actually doing all of the things that everyone said we were doing. We apologize, but hey, CM Punk is back. So what I'm saying is Spider-Man No Way Home, real great movie, real great movie. Okay. Ah! Ah! I was worried. 
I was worried, and I, I tweeted that like so many fanboys read clickbait, and now if uh, Spider-Man No Way Home doesn't produce Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Iron, you, you know, Iron Fist, Luke Cage, Mephisto, Magneto, Wolverine, fucking uh, Galactus, it, the Fantastic Four, fucking mutants then uh, everyone's going to riot. And, like, all of those things are not in Spider-Man No Way Home. But a surprising amount of them are. And so that's all I'm going to say. Incredible movie. The theater was almost sold out. I'm really happy that I got my booster. Yeah. Because that was the most people I've had in a theater since before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But it felt a lot like Endgame. So much yelling and screaming and cheering in the audience. And, and it was just a real incredible shared experience that I really, really liked. Kids, stop touching each other. Keep your hands off each other. Stop fighting. I shouldn't have to tell you kids to do this. <coughs> Spider-Man No Way Home, it is the CM Punk of movies. And it was oh, incredible, okay. and I can't wait to go see it again. Love that movie so freaking much. So uh, that's it for Steve Stubbs of the week. Next week, I'm going to see Guillermo del Toro's new movie, Nightmare Alley, which feels... I've seen the preview a couple of times, and I keep... It looks a lot like Todd Browning's Freaks, but without the Freaks, but just in the setting, the, like, carnival setting. And... Yeah. Um, I, I've been seeing previews that say uh, the most shocking ending of a film th that you'll see this year. And it's like, in my gut, it's the ending to Freaks. I, I've seen the preview. I've seen Todd Browning's Freaks. My gut, without knowing any spoilers, my gut is, at the end of this movie, what's his name, the guy who stars in it? He was also in a... Wet Hot American Summer, Bradley Cooper. Yeah. My gut tells me at the end of Nightmare Alley, Bradley Cooper has been uh, freaked. Has been turned into a chicken. Basically. That, yeah. yeah, that's my that's that's my guess. I'm also going to see the new Matrix movie, and if I can, I'm, I'm going to go see Spider-Man again, because, oh my God, freaking love that movie. So, so join us next week for more up-to-date movie reviews with... Steve Stubbs of the week, and cut on that. Um, do you want to head straight into Bunny versus? Do you need a potty break, Bunny? Uh, I think I could do it. I I personally don't have a hell of a lot to say. Okay, then then cool. Then let's go into that. Bunny. Yes. Are you ready for another exciting, pulse pounding, heart stomping? boob shaking installment of bunny verses are you ready are you pumped are you amped are you jazzed are you psyched are you primed are you revved up are you cocked and loaded are you ready bunny are you ready i'm not so sure about being cocked but i am loaded cool i'm a little bit high myself uh well then without any further ado it's time once again for bunny verses and now here is your host Bunny Williams, take it away, Bunny! And kind of bouncing off the last conversation, I, really, I, I think I found my new dream job. Because there has got to be somebody at Marvel that's just in charge of making shit up. And just putting uh, out disinformation but to keep fucking, everybody off the trail. Spider-Man No Way Home is 100% fan service the movie. I remember six months ago, a year ago, talking to Mal about Spider-Man No Way Home and saying, oh man, w wouldn't it be cool if this happened or this happened or what if... Uh, this person shows up or what if they have a scene where they're all talking and they say this? I was shocked at how much of that happened. There yeah. was one scene that uh, Mal and I 
talked about over and over again, and it 100% happened in this movie. And I was really? so happy to be like, oh my god, they had they had a scene, and, and oh, yeah, it was literally just fan service the movie. But it is disingenuous that for the last year or two, they've been saying, this is not happening! This is not happening, this is not happening, this is not happening, hey all of you fans, fuck you! And then the movie comes out and they go, oops, our bad. So, yeah, yeah, but the thing is, like, like, so much shit came out that wasn't happening that some just had to have happened. Yeah, you know, but like, but like, that's that's the role of the disinformation officer at at Marvel, which I want to be. I I want to be able to call up a random show and. Say Doctor Doom and then hang up real quick. Yeah, you know, I I was upset because they're like, oh my god, Alfred Molina's Doctor Octopus is coming back, Jamie Foxx's Electro is coming back, but but in in my heart, I was like, okay, but can we have Bruce Campbell show up? Yeah. Can we have? The guy who owned the pizza place show up. Can a Spider-Man deliver a fucking pizza? Yeah. I was thinking, like, what about Paul Giamatti's iconic rhino? Yes. The worst uh, Russian accent this side of Hawkeye. Uh, what about uh, the foreign guy who was renting the apartment to Peter? Can we get him? Yeah. What about, uh, uh, what's his name? The the first Eddie Brock from that. Can't we get that 70s show up in this bitch? Topher Grace. I just want to hear three lines from a new Spider-Man film. And I know that it's impossible, but if they can bring Harold Ramis back from the dead, then I can watch a Spider-Man film with the line... Bonesaw is ready. Yeah. None of those things happen. None of those things. And I'm pissed. I want Sally Fields Aunt May, damn it. <laughs> but uh other things did show up and happy for those, but I was hoping for a Bonesaw McGraw. Or uh what's his name? Uh the director of Evil Dead uh uh Sam Raimi's brother working Ted? at the Daily Bugle. I was hoping for that. That didn't Ted happen. Ted Raimi? Yeah. yeah I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of like a younger, sexier Aunt May, personally. Uh, and yeah. I do like the idea that, uh, as I've seen elsewhere, of course Joe Pesci is Uncle Ben. Yeah. Yeah. How can anyone doubt? Yeah. But I also feel that, like, Spider-Man No Way Home, incredible film, wonderful film. I, 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 I'm really hyped about this new Spider-Man movie, and I'm going to watch it a bunch more times. But also, Spider-Man No Way Home is running because Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse walked first. You yes. know what I'm saying? Yes. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you really should give credit where credit's due. If I have to pick between Spider-Man No Way Home and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, I love Spider-Man No Way Home. I'm picking the one with Spider-Ham. Yeah. Just period. Well, you know, and a black character. And a black character, yeah. But well, you have always been a Spider-Man, a spider, Spider-Ham mark. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't believe the fact that when I was little, I would go to the, the new, I went to the new comic book store by my house, and I asked them for kids' comic books, and they gave me the first issue of Spider-Ham, and I ended up buying every issue of Spider-Ham. I had a box, you know, like you used to do at comic book stores. I had a box, and they would put in yeah. my comic yeah. books. And Spider Ham was one of them, and I would I grew up talking to people about my love of Spider Ham, 
And even in my 20s and my 30s, people would be like, you made that up. There is no spider ham. There is no Dr. Ostrich. There is no Dr. Doom. But the fact that people know spider ham now blows my fucking balls away. Yes. Blown away by this. You know? Mm-hmm. It's like if it's like if Tom Holland's next movie was a bio about the life of Lee Van Cleef, <laughs> and then suddenly everyone has Lee Van Cleef fever, and then there's a bunch of people that would be like, "Oh my God, people love Lee Van Cleef now." Yeah, that's weird. Okay. There's a bunch of things that I wanted to uh, mention during right, uh, let, Bunny Birthdays. Let me get something out of the way first here because okay. we are going away for kind of a family reunion. Okay. And that will be from January 2nd to January 10th. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to miss both shows there on the 7th and the 9th. 7th and the 9th? The 2nd and the 9th. Thank you. Okay. January 2nd and 9th. No podcast. Well, that's okay. You can still do the 26th, Sorry. which will be next week, right. which will be our annual watching of Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny. Because we have to end every year with a discussion of Barry Mahon, Pirate World, and Nudie Cuties. Yes. Yes, we do. So that's next week, and I'm really excited about that because I will once again be writing all new notes about Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny and not at all just using the same notes that I wrote in episode 105. Because I don't even have those notes, so I don't know what... Uh, you're talking about I'll be writing all new notes so it's not yes. so next week oh man I'm going to be doing a bunch of writing and it won't be an easy one for me and a big shout out to everybody in the chat room we have a nice little crowd going on there it looks like so Yay. that's kind of nice hooray so there's a couple of so okay so no January 2nd no January 9th I'll plan something really nice for Something cool for the week after that. I don't know what, but we'll figure it out. So there's a couple of things I wanted to mention from last week and this week. Number one, all of my kids are now fully vaccinated. Yes. Very happy about that. Uh, and and uh, we did a really good video on my uh, kid-friendly YouTube channel where I was going to talk to the to kids about trying to get them to get the vaccine and then I realized that like you don't want to hear if you're a kid you don't want to hear an adult tell you about how important the vaccine is so I just had uh, Max and Eleanor just I interviewed them and I put it all together it's a great video and I really love it and I'm really proud of you kids for getting the vaccine um, I'm the first that I have them up there like Yes, the first when when you got your first shot, you were kicking and scratching and punching, and you yes. hit me numerous times. Uh, but yeah. you still did it. And then the second time, you didn't punch and scratch at all. You you, you kids were both so <coughs> brave, and I'm really proud of you kids. And you kids did so good. And yeah, yeah. And then last week in Oklahoma, it went from 35 degrees one... Like, I woke up, and it was 35 degrees out. And, I, I'm, and I'm bundling up my youngest for winter weather, because we're going... Well, I'm driving them to kindergarten, and it's 35 degrees. Guess what? And then by the time I pick them up, it's 78 degrees out. Yeah. It is insane <coughs> Oklahoma weather like yes, that. Um, yesterday we got to go out. Oh, hold on. The sound just uh, went totally off. Hold on. No, 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 no. Hold on. The sound just totally went off. Can you hear me? I got you. Okay. Whew. 
Okay. Hey, Mommy, guess what? What? Yesterday we got to go ice skating. You went yeah, ice skating? Yeah, because Emerald will be 20 years old tomorrow. Wow. Which is insane. I, I was taking... I. I was changing their diaper when they were one year old, and now they will be 20. That's a real mindfuck. Yes. Um, for me. I was scared and crying because I was scared if I slipped, but we got, they've got these little things where you, like, hold on tight. These little, then, like, walkers. Yeah, and then you skate, and then someone can hold on to you, or you could do it by your own. But I was scared, but it kind of was not that hard. Oh my god, there were two birthday parties and a church group there. And it was yeah. just like, I, I asked uh, Amber, is it basic white bitch day at the ice skating rink? And but, guess what? Um, we got gumball. <coughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, they always want things from machines, and I'm like, I don't have money. I don't have any money. I don't have any change in my purse. And you do. Yeah, this time I made sure, like, there's going to be something at the ice skating rink that kids are going to want, so I brought a bunch of quarters. You, got, you kids got gumballs. Uh, so, yeah, so it's been an exciting time. The kids are officially off of school until uh, next month. Well, on the ride home, I got nachos, and on the ride home, uh, the nachos went up, up, and straight onto my leg. How did that happen? Uh, it was like... It was going, and then it... You guys hit a bump or something? Bump, it went... Like, when we... Like, when you go over a train track. Yeah. Uh, it was like that, and my nachos went uh, up, up, and on my leg. Gotcha. Oh, my leg. Okay. Bye, Benny. And, and for the first time ever, we, we, we've been making gingerbread houses yeah and it's the first time that we as a family has done this have done I mean, this because uh no offense to anyone watching this that always kind of seemed like a white person christmas thing uh, that we just never did but yeah. there's a lot cooler ones we we saw a uh mario castle gingerbread house uh i'm building that right now and it is super fun. Yeah, and then Eleanor got like a Disney princess enchanted castle gingerbread house. I saw online, but we didn't buy it, a uh, dive bar gingerbread house. Yeah. And it's it, it's like a Budweiser dirt bar gingerbread house. And so we, we've been making them this week, and, and that's been fun. Also, I, I have not been dressing up and going out as a woman that much because oh, last week and this week it just hit me like a like a realization that like oh shit I am now a trans woman of color and we're just getting killed left and right and and just at first I was really scared about going out as a woman and then finally what you know it's like diving into a pool once you do it you're like oh this is actually good and I'm not that scared and I felt comfortable and I, I spent like days and days as a woman and then eventually it just hit me that like see you really do have to be cautious it is dangerous out there for a trans woman of color and that is what I am now and and yeah. I, I've just been I've just been worried, but I, I will say, I've been in women's bathrooms with other women. I have been at stores in line with people. I have talked to people. I have been to very busy places. I've been to the mall. I've been to Walmart. I've been to the grocery store. I've been all over the place as a woman. So far, I have not had a single negative experience at all. At all. Good. No one has said anything bad. No one has has uh, said anything behind my back. No one's laughed at me. No one's attacked me. No one is. No one said shit. Yesterday, I went to. I went ice skating with the kids, and I was all dressed up, all nice. And I, as I was walking, a guy checked me out. Yeah. And that was so awesome. I walked by, and the guy did one of those like '80s sort of sex comedy things where he's like, whoa. You know, one of those, like lifting yeah. the sunglasses, sort of hey. And, and it, it meant so much to me. Wow, I was ogled. 
Hooray! <laughs> I'm taking my first step into a much larger world. Yes. <laughs> so. Yeah. But you're doing it in a hive of scum, scum and villainy, so Yay. be careful. I will say, Can as a woman... Can you take up Kung Fu, maybe? I keep a box cutter with me in my purse. Just for safety's sake. I've never had to use it. I don't even use it to open up boxes. But I feel happy to know that it's in my purse. Yeah. And, and I can say now, as a woman... Why aren't there pockets in anything? Why do men get these big-ass fucking pockets, but only like a third of my clothes has pockets? It pisses me off. Why? Because I want pockets! It's just... It, it, I, Everything needs pockets out of mother. It, it, it upsets me. I think the, 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 the idea is women have purses. So they don't need pockets. I want pockets! The idea is, don't give women pockets, so they'll spend money on purses to hold out their shit. Yeah, yeah. So, I've become one of those women that has various uh, candies and mints just rumbling through their purse. <laughs> okay, but the true sign, the true sign, do you have a snotty tissue? Oh, I've always had snotty tissues. Oh, okay. Period. Is that Period. nothing new there? No, nothing new there. Yeah, so that's been my week. That's been my week. We have Christmas coming up. I'm woefully ill-prepared. I'm not prepared for Christmas. I'm not prepared for the kids to be home, but we'll see what happens. I'm excited. I'm excited to once again watch the double feature... I don't think we did it on the podcast, but I found it online on YouTube. I don't know if it's still there anymore, so when I first saw it, I made the point of downloading it. Uh, on Christmas Eve in the 90s, Comedy Central did a double feature of the Mystery Science Theater episodes of Santa Claus Conquers the Martians and that Santa Claus vs. the Devil Mexican movie. And they yeah. showed them back to back, and somebody recorded it with commercials and posted it on YouTube. And it's my favorite Christmas thing of all time. I don't even really watch Mystery Science Theater anymore, but that is my favorite thing to watch for Christmas. Yeah. Also, I'm kind of happy that we didn't uh, we didn't watch. We missed a week. That means that we won't be uh, discussing the 2019 Christmas movie Last Christmas. That's what we were going to do this week. Yeah. Uh, uh, the 2019 film Last Christmas, which is a jukebox musical featuring music from the band Wham! Wow! And there's a twist ending that's really bizarre, but it's in the lyrics. Last Christmas, I gave you my heart. That's the twist ending. It's really fucking weird. And I think I hate it, but I might like it. We were going to do it for the podcast, and then you canceled uh, last week's podcast, and it's yes. like, okay, maybe it's for the best. I kind of don't want to watch that movie right now, but, oh, man. Silent Night, Deadly Night 1 and 2. I've got a lot of backstory about the making of this, and uh, it's connection to Back to the Future. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah forgot about that. I haven't looked at these uh, notes for a while. Oh, and also, uh, we will also be talking about why Gene Siskel is rotting in hell. Okay. Again? Again! Again! Okay. okay. Fuck Gene Siskel. Fuck! He pisses me off. Yeah. So that's my week. How are you, Bunny? I'm, I'm, I'm good. I had a stomach thing come out from out of fucking nowhere last week. Yeah. Until I had to can This show is one of the bright spots of my week. I do not like to cancel it for any fucking reason. That's just how it is. But, I but, oh, I God, I woke up that. with just severe stomach cramps. 
And yes, pissing out my asshole. You know, that was actually... All fluid. Um, like, this should not be happening. Pissing out the asshole is actually the name of Mother Teresa's autobiography. Yes. Yes, it is. <coughs> really surprising. Because, you know, we have to keep poor people in poverty because it makes them closer to God. Yeah. You know, they, they don't really need medications to get better because they're blessed by God. Yeah, uh, back in my day, if you wanted to get closer to God, you would just fuck someone like an animal. Mm -hmm. That's a Nine Inch Nails reference. Yeah. To show you how uh, hip I am with young people. <laughs> <laughs> huh. You know, it's like my grandfather used to say to me. He would say, Stevie, despite all our rage, we are still just a rat in a cage. Yeah. 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 And in the end, it doesn't even matter. No. The love you make is equal to the love you take. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's how it goes. But yeah. why aren't we talking about Smash? That Smash? fucking show was excellent. Oh, Saturday morning All Star Hits. I fucking yes. love that so much. Fuck. I'm sorry. It's just I I binge watched it. I was going to watch it with Mal and with the kids, but nobody wanted to watch it. And I didn't want to, like, force them to watch it, so I watched it by myself. I woke up early one day and just started watching it. The day it came out, I, I was so excited for the show, I marked it on the, on the calendar. I put Kyle Mooney on Netflix this Friday. And so I woke up, and the first thing I did was get Emerald to school, get Mal to school, get... get Eleanor to school and then get Mal to school and then come home and just start watching Saturday morning all star hits. And oh, and then get Maxwell's school prepared, homeschool prepared while watching Saturday morning all star hits and then doing school with Maxwell while watching Saturday morning all star hits and then get, getting him lunch while watching Saturday morning all star hits and then while he ate lunch, I finished watching Saturday morning all star hits. And I'm just obsessed with that. It's so is fucking funny. Maxwell is still remote? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, we wanted all of our kids to be remote, but Mal did great, but not in math. And you had to be perfect in everything you were doing in homeschool to continue homeschooling. Uh-huh. Oh. Okay, so yeah, so Mal went back to, to in-person school, and then we wanted Eleanor to keep doing in-person school, but they decided not to do kindergarten as virtual this year, and so Eleanor had to go back to school, but Maxwell's grades last time were perfect, and uh, so yeah, he's still doing in-person, he's still doing at-home school, and he's doing great. Um, did that mom still got the no, he's still doing homeschool for the rest of the school year. Oh. Yeah, he is still going to be doing school at, at home with me. Oh. It's just, you know, this being Oklahoma, this being a red state, this being the Midwest, they, they want every kid to stop doing homeschool virtual school and to just go back into school where they can get sick and spread a virus because they're right wingers this is a right wing state and so the principal of virtual school who I think is also the principal of the in person school the principal said everyone has to have all of their assignments done by December uh, by December December 17th, and if they do not have all of their assignments done, then they will be forced to go back to in-person school in January. And so 
we were a bit scared about that. Maxwell always gets all of his assignments on time, but we were still scared about that. But apparently the teachers who are in charge of virtual school were like, oh, so yes, you have to have all of your assignments done. Also, we'll be giving you less assignments. <laughs> just just because we got your ass. We got yeah. you. We're assigning you less assignments. So usually Maxwell has 25 assignments to do for the week for five days of school. 25 assignments, 26 assignments, 28 assignments. One week he had 29 assignments, 30 assignments. This past week, he, they assigned him nine things to do. And you can tell that it's the virtual teachers just giving them less to do to make sure that no kids are forced by the principal to have to go back to in-person school, and I like that. Yeah. That was a nice little, like, hey, thanks for having our backs. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's us. Yay. Are, are, you, are, are you ready to go on a break and, and do this movie? I'm no. really excited to talk uh, about Silent Night, Deadly Night. No, the All Source Smash. We, we really have. Oh, yeah. We that's what we were talking about. I, I totally forgot. I totally forgot that's what we were talking about. I, I really, it's, right off the bat, it had that same kind of uncanny valley kind of feel that that Star Trek show I found on YouTube had. You know, yeah. where it's like, I really have oh. not, I don't think I have ever seen Saturday morning cartoons hosted by anybody. You know? I know. I know. But... Yeah. As soon as I saw this, like, it was, like, totally familiar. I I was hoping that you liked it and wouldn't give up on it because I knew that eventually, when you got to the pitch-perfect parody of Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue, yes. which we covered on the podcast, that you would appreciate the shit out of that. Oh, God, yes. Stop because the I, kids from saying, shut up. S up. S up. Yeah. Uh -huh. And all of the cartoon characters from the show show up. Oh, here's uh, uh, um, the dinosaur. Here is Randy, uh, Randy the, the teenage dinosaur. Here is the creator critters. Yes. And Paul Rudd was the voice of the guy from the creator critters. Oh, was it? Yeah, the guy who... who uh, the David Seville of the Creator Critters. Yeah. And then, I don't know who did the voice of Randy the Teenage Dinosaur, but Randy the Teenage Dinosaur's on-again, off-again girlfriend was Emma Stone. Really? Yeah. And then uh, one of the SNL guys, Chris Red, who's on SNL right now, he was... Um, one of the uh, pro bros. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it, I absolutely loved that show. And it said a lot to me just as a, as a sibling who was given shit by their parents while they heaped praise on the other child. Yeah. That is, so the show spoke a lot to me. And in the beginning of the show is when it hit me. This is just like the Sprouse twins, Cole and Dylan Sprouse, who starred in the Disney show, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. And then the follow-up show, The Sweet Life on Deck, where they were twins and they yeah. had their own TV show. And... And then I'm like, oh, and then one of the twins got a job in Riverdale, and we talked about it on the podcast. I said, I feel bad for the other brother, because they're exactly the same, yeah. but one is starring in a CW TV show. What the fuck is the other one doing? And then one of the brothers showed up in Saturday Morning All-Star Hits, and I'm like, holy shit, one of the Sprouse twins is in this. I got to IMDB this and see which one it is. It's the less popular brother who's not Jughead. <laughs> cool. Which My one was heart he? just He was the 
The Bobby there was the with guy the Bobby in the cartoon? Uh, no, there was the guy and the girl who went missing, and that was the mystery of the whole show. Oh! He was the blonde guy who the was missing. Blonde he's, computer guy. Yeah, he's the twin brother of uh, Jughead from Riverdale. That makes sense. Yeah, so the fact that the non-Jughead Sprouse twin was in Saturday Morning All-Star Hits lends credence to Skip and Trey Bohr. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what is the seven degrees of supernatural to this, honey? The Sprouse Brothers. The Sprouse Brothers. We're on Zack and Cody, yeah. And their mother was the dead mom from Supernatural. Their mother was Kim Rhodes. Oh, who plays Jody in Supernatural? There you go. Everything ties to Supernatural. There's the Supernatural connection to Saturday Morning All Star Hits. Wonderful fucking show, and I'm so glad you liked it. I was worried that it was parodying something that wasn't your time and that you wouldn't like it. Oh, no, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And again, it felt familiar. The cartoons felt really familiar. You know. Yeah, the, the cartoons had a shittiness that felt like late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But then the whole... Two twins hosting the show. That felt like nineties, like like a like a CW or like a Fox Saturday morning sort of a thing, but like it's Yeah, it, exactly. But you can tell that Kyle Mooney knows his fucking shit. But it's he knows still his eighties and nineties T V shows. Yeah. And even the commercials and shit that they yeah. did. Yeah. We're the shoes, all very nostalgic feeling. The shoes where you make the hole. Yeah. I like that one. And then they were like, I when I was a kid, I loved Mad Balls. Yeah. And they were just like like tennis balls, but they had gross faces on them, and I loved them. And they had the same thing, but they were like gross cubes. Yeah. Uh-huh. And there were commercials for those, and I liked those. I would have liked more commercials, but I was surprised at how invested I got with, like, the create a Criddles plot. And yeah. the plot of Randy the Teenage Dinosaur. I was shocked at how, at how um, upset I got with... How bad they did, my 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 boys, the Strongimals. Yeah. And it's like, oh, the Strongimals, and then Skip in the Strongimals, and then it's Skip with a cameo by the Strongimals in the Strongimals action band. Yeah. Uh huh. They kind of got I, booted by their own. Yeah. Yeah. They but got God, booted off their own show. Yeah. But everyone needs to see. Uh, Saturday morning All Star Hits. It's on Netflix for shit's sake. It's, I love it, and, and I hope to God he makes more. Back and you, you're watching a couple of episodes and you're like, oh, this is cool. This is funny. You know, it's a parody of Saturday Morning. Uh huh. It's you know, and then like, out of nowhere, a plot has crept up on you. Yeah. And yeah. And you're like, holy Next. fuck, this show has a plot. Next thing you know, there's a plot and reoccurring characters and things start tying into each other. And, and yeah, yeah, it, it becomes a story. It, be yeah. it goes beyond parody and becomes like a pl plot. And there's lore. And so much sub sandwiches. Yes. Uh... Subs? We've all been saying that, despite the fact that I'm the only one who watched this. Yeah. I got everyone saying that. Uh, subs? Yeah. yeah, I did show you that part. Yeah. I love that show. Everyone needs to see it. It's my next 
I think you should leave. So, the same guy did play Skip and Trabor and the Justin Bieber kind of character. Yeah, that like, uh, it, it, it was like Johnny a... Johnny Rush or Johnny... Yeah, Johnny Rad. Yeah. It was like a combination of like Justin Bieber, Johnny Depp, uh, 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 both Corys, Hayden yeah. and Feldman, and uh, Joey Lawrence, who appears in every Mace piece for it. And you just get all of those and put them in a blender, and that was it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I will say, I was expecting when Kyle Mooney would play so many characters, I was expecting to see that line of division between it, that sort of like a identical cousins sort of a yeah thing. And, and they they did somewhat you know uh, but then they're but, they but then did they're, a, they did a good job of blending the two of them together yeah there are sometimes really mostly when it was just the two of them doing the show yeah that they really overlapped yeah and one would be behind the other and things like that yeah, but there are some times when they're walking past each other and they're fighting each other, and it's like, y'all have done a really good job of having, like, three Kyle Moonies on the screen at the same time and it not looking like shit. Yeah. You did pretty damn good. Yeah. And oh, yeah. then, and then little Brucey is a Bobby's World parody. Um, starring a character that Kyle Mooney used to regularly do on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really weird that a character he does on SNL made an appearance in like two or three episodes of his Netflix show, which means there's a Kyle Mooney extended universe. Yeah. <laughs> The Kyle Mooneyverse is suddenly a thing, and that's weird. Yes. So yeah, I love that show, and I'm so glad that you loved it. I was, yeah. I'm still upset that you didn't fall head over heels in love with. I think you should leave with Tim Robinson. Yeah, and I, I, I... <sighs> tables lost a bit of esteem for you on that one, but you've made it up. Tables. Tables! <laughs> Fucking love. Like, it, it, I, I take the kids to the store, and, and, and they're like, Dad, there's some steaks. Can we buy steaks and slop them up? And I'm like, no, we're not making sloppy steaks, kids. <laughs> not making sloppy steaks. Let's slop them up! Yeah. I know, I know you want to make sloppy steaks. Yes. Oh, get down, get down! You're gonna break this chair. It's very expensive. But yeah, so so that's all I've got for Bunny Versus. Everyone should watch Saturday Morning All Star Hits on Netflix. It's oh God, wonderful. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Just watching the show. The only thing I could possibly say in response to Saturday, Saturday morning all-star hits is self-adhesive tape? Yes, please. Nice. I always love that. And cut on that. Buddy! Yes! Uh, we still have a movie or two to get to. We still have two movies to get to. We need to talk well, about we, Silent Night, Deadly Night. We have a movie and a bit. We have a movie and a half. Yeah. To get to. Yeah. Uh, we uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Natasha's right. We have a movie and a meme to discuss. <laughs> yes. And we also need to talk about uh, why uh, Gene Siskel is burning in hell. We need to talk about this movie's connection to, to 
Back to the Future and my own ideas for uh, Back to the Future uh, uh, spinoffs. I have an idea for some Back to the Future spinoffs. And also, I did come up with some uh, other holidays that can get horror films. Yeah. And I'm pretty proud of, of those. But before we get to any of that, maybe we should take a break. Should we take a break? We should take a break. Okay, I concur. We will be right back with more of the Popon film after this. Do 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 Skitty Papa do wow and break. Where's my puppet? It's like a fucking teamster. Every time you turn around, he's off on a coffee break. We got a building to put up here. My name is Mr. Steve. I'm a storyteller. Hello, everybody. Mr. Steve here, and it's time for another Mr. Steve short story time. Today's story time is... We're different, we're the same, and we're all wonderful. A Sesame Street book. We're different. Our noses are different. We're the same. Our noses are the same. They breathe and sniff and sneeze and whiff. Our hair is different. Our hair is the same. It grows on us in several places. It warms our heads and frames our faces. Our mouths are different. Our mouths are the same. Their lips form the words we say and smile when it's a happy day. Our skin is different. Our skin is the same. It tells us something's cold or hot or wet or dry. It knows a lot. Muscles and bones are wrapped inside it. We all have blood and skin to hide it. It keeps in warmth. It keeps out dirt. It warns us so we don't get hurt. Our eyes are different. Some of them are googly, googly eyes. Our eyes are the same. They see, they blink, they weep, they wink. Oh, remember when you could be in a movie theater like that? Our bodies are different. He used to be an imaginary friend. That's true. Our bodies are the same. They stretch and bend and work and play. They all need food and rest each day. They dance and wriggle and ride a bike. They might look different, but they're alike. Our feelings are different. Same, Telly Monster, same. Our feelings are the same. Lonely, worried, scared, excited, happy, loving, glad, delighted. I want to go to the haunted house. We're the same. We're different. That's what makes the world such fun. Many kinds of people, not just one. A rainbow would be boring if it were only green or blue. What makes a rainbow beautiful? 
is that it has every hue. So aren't you glad you look like you? We're different. We're the same. Can you kids spot Elmo in this picture? Dude, I really like these guys. They're jamming. Pretty sure that's the Grateful Dead. Okay, I'll give you five more seconds to find Elmo. Five, four, three, two. He's right there. He's right there. You see him? This this guy, not, not, not this old woman. This guy. We're wonderful. The end. Yay! Well, that's today's story. Did you like that, boys and girls? Remember, we're different, we're the same, and we're all wonderful. Just because someone is a different size, a different color, a different something, doesn't mean that they're any different than you. We're different, but we're all the same. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Be sure and like and subscribe and all those things I'm supposed to say because I'm somebody on YouTube. We'll see you later. Bye. <laughs>
that one too. I hear you're getting a lot of hits on Tinder. Nice. No, I will not let you cover me in mustard and sauerkraut, you pervert. Wait, wait, wait. Is that in Germanian dollars? Yeah. Yeah, now we're talking. It has been brought to my attention that there's a gentleman out there by the name of Jean. Now, Jean is very close to somebody that I know from a long, long time ago. He is a friend of mine, and therefore, Jean, by de facto, we are good friends as well. And now, Jean, I shall read this for you. Rusty Cage. You wired me awake and hit me with a hand of broken nails. You tied my lead and pulled my chain. To watch my blood begin to boil. But I'm going to break. I'm going to break my. I'm going to break my rusty cage and run. Too cold to start a fire. I'm burning diesel. Burning dinosaur bones, yeah? I'll take the risk. Down to still water and ride a pack of dogs. But I'm going to break. I'm going to break my. I'm going to break my rusty cage. It's like a Phillips head into my brain. It's going to be too dark to sleep again. Cutting my teeth on bars and rusty chains. But I'm going to break. I'm going to break my rusty cage and run. When the forest burns along the road like God's eyes in my headlights. When the dogs are looking for their bones and it's raining ice picks on your steel shore. But I'm going to break. I'm going to break my. I'm going to break my rusty cage. I have to tell you something. I'm only a myth. And until next week, I'll be missing you. Before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, 
not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. to do the intros when we would come back from a break and I would really say and we're back with more of the Pope on film I would really punch it and so when Bunny took over uh, bringing us back in he would go and we're back and I'm like Bunny can you can you punch it up can you punch it can you give it some pizzazz the old razzle dazzle you know come on give it some chutzpah you know oh so now okay. every time that he does, he does sound a bit like a ghost, but that's him giving it the old college try, the old 23 well, skidoo. if it's any, any, uh, <laughs> kind of con consolation, it's funny. I liked it when you were just like, eh, we're back. Nope. I liked it. That's fine, but... <laughs> I liked it. But he needs to put some... But that oomph. might be because I'm living in the same house where the person that does... Buddy! So, Buddy! Yeah. 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 Oh. It's time, Bunny! Yes, it is. Uh, yes, Bunny, my friend, it is time yet again for all of us here at the Pope on Film Podcast to pick ourselves up from our bootstraps and finally, in eventually, getting around to discussing our all-new collection of easy listening hits from the 60s, 70s, and 80s on four LPs, three cassettes, or two CDs. So call now, Movie of the Week! And this week, we are continuing our annual deep dive into holiday movies with an epic 1980s horror movie double feature. This week, we discuss Silent Night, Deadly Night, one and two. One and one and a half, or one yeah. and a quarter. Yeah, and we'll be discussing that when we get to the second film. When the first movie came out in 1984, yet another film cashing in on uh, Johnny Carpenter's Black Christmas remake Halloween, uh, people went mad screaming ape shit over this movie, over Silent Night, Deadly Night. I blame that trailer. That trailer makes it seem as if Santa himself is going around killing people, and so, yeah. of course, parents went nuts. That trailer was so good. I and don't that know. I, I, think, I think it was a leak. I, I, yeah? I don't think it was... I think it was a created controversy. Well, the creator specifically said, we're going to get a lot of heat. A lot of parents are going to be pissed off at us. A lot of parents are going to protest because they are not going to like the way we painted the Catholic Church. And, and we know they won't like it because we called them and told them about it. He was specifically convinced that the Catholic Church would go nuts over their... Uh, interpretation 
of like the fact that the killer really gets pushed over the edge by the you know Catholic orphanage, yeah, and the strict nuns who would like beat the kids, and so the producer and director and everything were like, uh, "Oh, so you parents are upset? Yeah, I bet you are. I've been waiting for you to be upset. What are you upset about? Oh, Santa." Oh, shit, you're not mad about all the nun shit? Are you sure? You don't want to be upset about the nun shit? Because we were ready to fight the Roman Catholic Church, not parents who were pissed about the way we depicted uh, an imaginary fat guy. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. So, so, yeah, people complained. They protested. They picketed. The PTA tried to stop the release of the film. It was banned all over the place. The trailer only showed for like a week in theaters until parents and until everyone just demanded that they stop showing the preview. It was a fish. It wasn't officially released in England until 2009. Really? Because it was a video nasty. Yeah, and there's and I think I've said this before. There's a movie that I think that you would appreciate called Censored. Censor? Yeah. It's called Censor. It came out in England this year, and I think this year I don't even think it played in theaters in America. I think it went straight to like a digital release. But it's about a woman in the eighties who is one of those people who has to watch all of the horror movies and make notes for you have to remove this scene, cut all of this out, re-edit this scene. So she's a video nasties, I don't know, judge, I guess. Yeah. And the movie is about her slowly going insane. It's a video nasties horror movie, and it's done really well. And I really, really like it. For a while, it was going to go on my top ten best movies of the year but it's an honorable mention at this point, but a uh, really good movie about the, the British video nasties. Yeah. Really like it. Uh, so, uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night, I'm a little bit high. Silent Night, Deadly Night, let's talk about one of its main critics. Uh, noted asshole Gene Siskel. Okay. Okay. Now, We've talked about him before and why he is a noted asshole, but here's a refresher course in case you you don't have the Pope on film, the home game. He literally doxed, in his review of Friday the 13th, he literally doxed the cast. Yeah. He was like, here is the address of the man who owns the company, who owns the company, who released the film. And the woman who plays Jason's mother, here is her full name and the small town where she lives. You should track her down and tell her how upset you are at Friday the 13th existing. You just doxed an actress. Like, it's yeah. her fault that the movie came out. Not only that, but you, you, you spoiled the ending of the film in the first paragraph of your review. You're a fucking asshole for that alone. Yeah. But in his review of Silent Night, Deadly Night, on his TV show with Roger Ebert, he read out loud the name of the companies that own stock in distributor TriStar Pictures and read the names of the production crew and said that everyone who in any way was responsible for the creation of Silent Night, Deadly Night were paid with blood money. Oh, blood money. Okay. Yeah, blood fake money. Fake blood money. Yeah. yeah, fake blood money. But he literally read the names of the production crew on the show to shame them for making this movie. What the fuck is wrong with... What the fuck was wrong with goddamn Gene Siskel? It's like, okay, you don't like the movie. Okay, that's fine. But uh, it's literally like if he truly hated a movie, 
that he wanted harm to come to the people who made it. Yeah. He was doxing motherfuckers left and right. What the fuck was wrong with you? So one positive about uh, Gene Siskel is that he is probably burning in hell right now. So. But again, the, all the controversy, all the controversy is what has us talking about a shit movie like 40 yeah. years later. Yeah. yeah. That is a good point. The, this, is, this is the film brought to you by the Streisand effect. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if the producer and director uh, Kevin Smith this. Yeah. Like Kevin Smith actually uh, he went to a showing of Dogma and saw people protesting and joined the protest. Yes. So I wouldn't be surprised if some of the protests were uh, were that. I didn't see anything in my research, but uh, the orig- so the original Silent Night, Deadly Night was fraught with controversy. So much so that the movie was pulled from all theaters after only one or two weeks. Yeah. And again, it wasn't even like the first Santa Claus killer. Yeah. Christmas Evil was 1980. Yeah. Yep. Along with along with uh, there was a killer, Chris, killer Santa Claus in Alfred Hitchcock Presents, for Christ's sakes. We would, uh... And other, other things like it. So, I like, saw it, this. it's not something that's never been done. It's not something that's never been touched before. Yeah. But everybody decided to get upset this time for some reason. Yeah, I have no idea. But it only played for, like, a week or two in theaters, but in that time probably due to the controversy, uh, it made $2.5 million in theaters in only like two weeks, and that's off of a budget of $750,000. Yeah. So this movie was a big hit. $750,000 despite... sounds kind of like a lot. Yeah. So, that's, so, that, so this movie was a big hit, despite or possibly because of the controversy. Fun fact, this was released on the exact same day as A Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. That is uh, shocking to me. One of the sisters, the, the first nun you see who is uh, teaching the class, looks a lot like a young Ellen DeGeneres. Yeah. Like a lot. And it got to the point where it's like, I want to look up and see who this woman is. And she's an actress who has been in nothing I've ever seen. But the character is Sister Ellen. Mm. I'm not sure what that means, but it means something. I just don't know what. Bunny, why don't you hit us with the plot of the first film? Plot of the first film. Yes. Little kid sees Santa Claus murder his parents uh, and then is raised and abused by nuns uh, and then gets a job and snaps and kills people while in a Santa Claus outfit. Yeah, that's pretty much it. wasn't a deep movie. No, it was not. It was not. Fun fact, Bunny, the grandpa who warns Billy right at the beginning, you know who that is? Uh, I, I looked him up, but no, remind me. That's old man Peabody. He used to own all of this land. He had this crazy idea about breeding pine trees. Yes. Yeah, he was fucking in uh, Back to the Future the next year. Yeah. And that got me thinking about Back to the Future. Okay, so (coughs) in the beginning when they do the experiment, the experiment happens at Twin Pines Mall. And Dr. Brown mentions that old man Peabody used to own all of this land, uh, used to be farmland. Old man Peabody owned all of this. He had this crazy idea about breeding pine cones. And then... (coughs) 
<coughs> Marty McFly goes back to 1955. He flees the farm, <coughs> an old man Peabody shooting at him. When he drives off, he drives through a pine tree, and old man Peabody yells, My pines! And so when he goes back to 1985, he doesn't notice this, but the sign for Twin Pines Mall now says Lone Pine Mall. Yeah. So it is safe to say that this is one example of how Marty McFly carelessly fucked with all of existence. Yes. So that's... I, I started thinking about that. How else did Marty fuck with time? Yes. And I think I'd like to see a series of short films or maybe some animated shorts or maybe a film about all of the other ways that Marty McFly has ruined all of humanity because he's just bouncing around in 1955 just like fucking with everyone. Butterfly effect, motherfucker. Yes. You can't Indeed. just go you can't just go back in time and make out with your mom and then come back and think that everything's going to be fine. Butterfly, fucker! Yeah. So, here's my idea. Goldie Wilson is like a janitor at the soda shop in the 50s. Yes. He's just cleaning the toilets and cleaning the glasses and throwing out the trash. Cleaning the toilets. And uh, he becomes mayor. But what Marty does is he sees him in 1955 and says, you are going to be mayor. So now Goldie's like, mayor. Yeah. I like the sound of that. Mayor Goldie Wilson. So now all he wants to do is be a mayor. What if in Marty's timeline... He is a janitor at the soda shop. Then the 50s go into the 60s and the 70s. Civil unrest, protesting, segregation, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, the Black Panthers. And here is Goldie Wilson at the soda shop who decides that he needs to be a leader. And he starts helping get black people to have the same rights as the white man and he becomes a leader and he is eventually becomes mayor because the people of Hill Valley respect him and all of the work he did in the 60s and 70s helping people become equal and now all he wants is to be fucking mayor yes he doesn't become a civil rights leader and when he does become a mayor all he's doing is being a corrupt motherfucker, taking bribes and fucking having people killed for all we know, and he's no longer a civil rights leader. What if Goldie Wilson was the one thing that was keeping civil rights together? Marty McFly has ruined black people! Yes. Okay, here's another one. Um, rock music no longer exists in 1985. Okay. Because Chuck Berry comes up with the rock and roll sound. But now he does it because he knows that some fucking white kid in the middle of nowhere created rock and then disappeared. So he now doesn't create rock music that Elvis then copies blatantly and becomes the father of rock and roll. Rock doesn't exist because Marty McFly had to invent it. Yeah, yeah. Here's another one. Lorraine's dad kills John F. Kennedy. Okay. Because, uh, oh, hey, does anyone know where this street is? Oh yeah, it's uh, just uh, two streets north of blank. And Marty McFly goes, oh yeah, that's uh, John F. Kennedy Street. And Lorraine's dad goes, Who the hell is John F. Kennedy? He becomes obsessed with that name. Yeah. John F. Kennedy. Never heard of that. 
what is John F. Kennedy? So when John F. Kennedy becomes a politician and then becomes president, Lorraine's dad is obsessed with him. And it's him that kills JFK. Uh huh. I'm just saying that if Marty changed the name of a mall, there's a bunch of other shit that went wrong in the timeline that we don't know about. True. And I'd like True. to see that focused on. And also, I think that the ways that Marty McFly ruined time are more exciting to talk about than Silent Night, Deadly Night. And we don't know for a fact that he didn't fuck his mom. Yes, yes, that is correct. All we know is he didn't fuck his mom on camera. I loved taking Amber to go see Back to the Future the last night that the uh, Hornbeck Theater in Shawnee, Oklahoma was open. It was open from 1947 to 2020. The goddamn pandemic killed this classic movie theater. And I didn't realize that Amber had never seen Back to the Future before. And when you grow up with a classic film like that, you look at it differently. And so Amber leaned over to me and said, there's a lot of incest in this. And it's like, yeah, yeah, there is. And, and, and you don't realize that when you grow up with Back to the Future. She also leaned over to me and said, I don't know if this black band would be playing to an all-white school. <laughs> there is no black people at Hill Valley High School. So, uh, yeah, it makes you think. But I want to make it clear, Bonnie, that we did see the 85-minute-long unrated cut. They did yeah. uh, cut a number of things later. My brother rented this movie when I was, like, 9 or 10. And I remember we were having a sleepover with, like, our cousin, and we were all sleeping in the, like, living room. And my brother put on Silent Night, Deadly Night, and I remember pretending to be asleep, but watching it while feigning sleep, which was great because I could just close my eyes for the scary parts. Uh, and, and my brother and my cousin Tony and I would quote, we just thought for some reason one scene was hilarious. And it's like, oh, I'm the cop. I better go down to this basement. It's gonna be scary. Slowly go down. Ah! Nothing. Let me look over here. Ah! Nothing. But well, what about over here in the corner? Ah! Nothing. Okay, let me go up the stairs and punish! <laughs> yeah. And we would say that to each other. We would just go, punish! <laughs> We thought that was hilarious, and I'm not sure why. One of the things that I liked about Silent Night, Deadly Night is that inside of Ira's toys, there are actual toys. You can yeah. see Crawl the board game. Crawl the board? Okay. I looked really closely. There was Smurfs toys. There was Stuff Your Face the Game, which I absolutely remember putting balls in like a clown's mouth. I remember that. There was the Matchbox Super Garage, which a lot of people had, and a whole section of Return of the Jedi toys. And I appreciated that. That was cool. So, yeah, uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night. The movie is kind of shit, but it's dumb fun. The LA Times said that this would be considered one of the worst films of all time. And no... No, it was, the... it, it, was, it was a substandard slasher flick like a lot of sub, substandard slasher fi flicks that we had at the time. Yeah. They did a fairly interesting job setting up the, the psychosis. Yeah. You know, setting up a person who's close to snapping. Yeah. You know, not a great job, but a, a, an okay job. I also like just the fact that, like, <coughs> I grew up, I grew up in a strict religious upbringing. Time to murder. I yeah. like that. I, I just, just that I appreciate. But yeah, the new, the L.A. Times said this would be one of the worst films of all time. I mean, it's dumb fun. 
It's a dumb, fun slasher. It's not Recep <coughs> Eva Deke 5. We get more clicks when we talk about Recep Eva Deke. Yes. The legendary Turkish series of films. So, shout out Although to Recep Although there are at least five Silent Night, Deadly Night movies, I see. Okay, and let me talk about that. I have a fun story. Okay. So when the first Silent Night, Deadly Night came out, a bunch of people were speaking out against it. And one of the most vocal opponents of Silent Night, Deadly Night, was actor Mickey Rooney. Yes. You know, all three foot two of him, Mickey Rooney, was like, oh, this is ruining children and ruining Christmas, and, and, and this is disgusting. And he was the most vocal opponent of Silent Night, Deadly Night. He was disgusted by it. Absolutely disgusted. And then <coughs> later, uh, he agreed to be in a horror movie called The Toy Maker. And it was about a toy maker who went nuts and he started making toys that would come to life and kill people. Like that, like that Puppet Master series, you know, yeah. demonic toys or whatever. It was called The Toy Maker, and it was about this old guy, and he made toys that started killing people. And he made the film, and then the film was being edited in post-production, and right before the film came out, the producer said, Hey, we just got the rights to Silent Night, Deadly Night, and they changed it to Silent Night, Deadly Night 5, The Toy Maker. And that's how really? Mickey Rooney... The biggest proponent of Silent Night, Deadly Night accidentally starred in a Silent Night, Deadly Night film. That's pretty awesome. That's fucking awesome. That's ironic as hell. That's what Alanis Morissette was singing about. That story was like rain on your wedding day. Fucking yes. love that. And then people attacked Mickey Rooney, and it's like, how could you be in a Silent Night, Deadly Night film after all the things that you said? And he has to say, like, look, I didn't know I was starring in a Silent Night, Deadly Night film. And it's like, oh, a likely story. But he totally didn't know. They just, they just screwed him, and I fucking love that. <laughs> So the first film is a legendary, low-budget, controversial 80s slasher, fun. Came out the same day as the first Nightman, Nightmare on Elm Street, Silent Night, Deadly Night is a dumb classic. But the second movie... Oh. What a piece of shit. Okay, so for our audience, if you really don't want to watch either the first or second Silent Night Bloody Night movies Silent Night Deadly Night movies but for some reason you you either have to watch it or you have to fuck a pig on national television watch the second one yeah cause the second one has the first one and really not much else. <laughs> yeah, no, it absolutely does not. It absolutely does not. So the producers are like, hey, Silent Night, Deadly Night 1, huge hit. We need to make a second one. So they get a crew together and they say, here, make Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. Here you go. Here's a ridiculously small amount of money. And... The the director is like, um, we would love to make a Silent Night, Deadly Night 2, but you know this ridiculous amount of money you gave us? Uh, it's a ridiculously small amount of money, and we absolutely cannot make a film with this. And what the producer said was, look, we just want to make a second one, release it in on VHS. So... This is what you do. You get the original film, just re-edit it, and release it as Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. It's not hard. <coughs> mm -hmm. So the producers wanted the entire film to just be the first film. But the director, Lee Harry, insisted, like, 
I cannot do this. I have to make another film. But it, if you want me to use the first film, I can do that. And that's why, like, 30 to 40 minutes of this film is just flashbacks from the first film. The producers wanted the entire thing minutes. to just be the first one. 40 yeah. minutes. Not yeah. 30 to 40 minutes. It was motherfucking 40 minutes. The first 40 minutes of this movie is the first movie. Now, yeah, what also... How is he flashing back to his brother's memories? Yeah, especially okay. when he was like three. And then how well, is he flashing there. back to his brother's memories when his brother wasn't even in the scene? Yeah. I don't know. I... I think we have to explore this new superpower further right? in depth. Yeah. But the what the producer originally wanted was film an opening where someone's in a loony bin. Show the first film again and then film a scene afterwards where he's still in the loony bin and he's telling the story of the first film. There you go. We'll just call it Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. But to his credit, the director insisted, no, I have to film an actual movie. And he's the reason why it's just 40 minutes and not the whole movie. Yes. So that's fucking crazy. Silent Night, Deadly Night 2 hardly feels like a film. No. Period. No. No, so many of these, so many of the scenes, the new scenes, are just shot in his neighborhood. Yeah. Very just Tammy and the T Rex. Not even a fucking Santa suit. Killing people with a gun. You know? Yeah. It's very Tammy and the T Rex. I'm just going to use everything <laughs> in front of my house. And as but, much as I, I, I would love to hate the star of this movie, which I do kind of hate, but goddamn, he fucking tried. He was yep. awful, but he tried. He put his all into it. And still just, hey, he still just up. To be clear, uh, for all the people who are just listening to this, I am repeatedly raising my eyebrows up and down, which is what the star of Silent Night, Deadly Night 2 considers acting. Yes. <laughs> so that's exciting. And uh, the most awesome fake diabolical like laughter yeah. ever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Garbage day. Greatest line read of all time. Yeah, it's it's just like, it, it, and that he is doing it just on the neighborhood street where, like, you can kind of picture like he does this great diabolical laugh, and like somebody's like. Uh, excuse me, I have to get to the mailbox? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, uh, fun fact. Uh, even though this film is hardly a film, when they were done with it, the credits, the movie still ran too short. So to rectify this in the theatrical version, which we didn't see, the credits ran 10 minutes long and included not only the full crew for Silent Night, Deadly Night 2, but also to pad out the credits, the full crew of the original film. Really? Yeah. Okay. So, so I think and that's hilarious. And not just hilarious. like slowing it down, like Born Into Mafia. Yeah, <laughs> fucking Born Into Mafia. Slowing down the end credits. Yeah. But, uh... uh 
Yeah, the guy does a good job being a weirdo. And I definitely have been in that movie theater. The guy being loud and calling people a fag in the movie theater in Silent Night, Deadly Night 2, that happened to me. Thanks, dear Evan Hansen. Yes, yes, true, yes. And now, and now, again, what was the movie playing? Mm-hmm. What was... The, Silent Night, Deadly Night. Yeah, the first yeah. Silent Night, Deadly Night yeah, is what was they, playing in the theater. Yeah, they were showing more scenes from fucking Silent Night, Deadly Night that they couldn't do in a flashback. Why they couldn't yeah. do it in a flashback? I don't know. He He remembered... He remembered his brother's memories of guys snow sledding. Okay? He could yeah. have remembered the the other Santa coming out of the liquor store. Yeah. Ugh. Uh, but we here at the Pope on Film podcast think that every holiday should get a cheesy horror movie. So I have three ideas. Okay? Yeah. And, and I'm pretty proud of this because we believe that every holiday should get a cheesy horror movie. So, number one. I, and I originally wanted all these to be dumb, stupid ideas. I think all of these are pretty good. Uh, so, well, except for the last one. But, okay. Veterans Day of the Dead. Veterans Day of the Dead, okay? There's a toxic spill that happens near a veteran's cemetery. And the toxic spill happens on Veterans Day Eve. And then on Veterans Day, all of the zombies come back. Veteran zombies. Okay. I think that is a legitimately decent idea. So that's number one. Number two. Really proud of this one. Secretary's Day. Secretary's mm. Day. Rated R. Yeah. So uh, there's a CEO, and he hates Secretary's Day. But then what happens? His family is killed by a secretary. So he dresses as a secretary and starts killing other secretaries. In my mind, it's Billy Zane and drag. Okay. Because one thing I know, Billy Zane looks great as a woman. Yeah, okay. So he would be great killing people dressed as a secretary in Secretary's Day, rated R, in theaters Friday. Now this... Rated R. Rated R. Like that one uh, Simpsons Yeah. So this one's a bit reaching, but uh, national. Well, ice I don't know. Day. I'm kind of, I'm kind of picturing like nine to five, but like way more satanic. Yeah. Okay. You know? What about nine to six six six? I now we're talking. Now we're cooking with gas. Mm -hmm. So here's my third movie, uh, National Ice Cream Day. Uh, a family is killed. Uh, not sure. Not sure. The family is killed by a brain freeze. Okay. But then one kid sees this happen. And when he gets older, he decides to take revenge on ice cream and starts uh, picking people off one by one in an ice cream factory. Well, wait a second. I, I think... You probably didn't hear her, but Jeannie said something, and I think she might be on to something. Like, they go crazy from having brain yeah, freeze. Maybe you get brain freeze so bad into a zombie. that it drives you to kill, or you become a zombie, or something like that. It is the result yes. of the brain freeze. Okay, a brain freeze that never stops. Yeah. Just that pain that you get from a brain freeze, but then it only lasts like five seconds. The pain continues, and it causes you to start killing people. That's a decent idea. <laughs> that is good. And that's what causes the violent rage, is that your, your, 
brain freeze never stops. Yeah. And then the day that everyone started going mad and killing people was forever known as National Ice Cream Day. Rated right R. I am pretty sure that there is a a spoof slasher movie, President's Day. Yeah. I'm pretty sure of that, too. But I think these are all good ideas. These are all damn good ideas. I think these are solid ideas. Yes. Yeah. I also have an idea for... Um, for for a, a movie or a short movie... It's, it's had a couple of different names. I may have already talked about this on the podcast, but I really like the idea, so I'm going to talk about it again if I've talked about it before. The, the title that I have for it now is Dia de los Automobiles. Okay. Okay, so this is what the movie's about. On the Day of the Dead um, is a day to celebrate dead people, and the idea is, is that they come back as a ghost and if you leave things at their gravesite then like say my dad always liked whiskey I leave a whiskey bottle at his gravesite on the day of the dead and the ghost will come into our realm and be able to take that back with him and yes. it's a day to celebrate uh, the people who have passed on in your life and a way to remember them but in America, a lot of times people don't remember the people who have died. But you know how some people do? By putting a cheesy sticker on the back of their car. Yes. So on the day of the dead, if you died and a loved one put a sticker on the back of their car, then Congratulations! On the day of the dead, you will be spending all day on top of that car. <laughs> and you just, oh my goodness, I'm back. It must be the day of the dead. And then you realize you're going 75 miles per hour on a freeway. <laughs> and it's all about just car ghosts. <laughs> For one day, yeah, S car ghosts, and just for one day, there's ghosts on the top of a bunch of cars. Yes. And maybe you know two people, and it's like, oh, Franks, oh shit, Phil, how you doing? Good. What are you up to? Oh, my daughter has to go to Target. Hmm. See ya. And then, and then maybe like someone parks at a cemetery, and all the ghosts in the cemetery are making fun of him. Yeah. Stop it, guys. And it's like, ha ha! I'm in the cemetery. My wife gave me a pack of cigarettes. Check this out. I'm smoking, and I'm a ghost. What are you doing? Oh, uh, after this, we're getting an oil change. <laughs> and, then we, and then we gotta go to Aldi and pick up some fruit. But yeah, I keep thinking about that. There's a lot of people with those you know, stickers on the back of their cars, and I think of that all the time now. Uh, you know, yeah. like, there's a ghost on top of that car. You know cargo? You know cargo? Yeah. What if a cargo just absorbed a car, and it's a car ghost? Nice. Wait, maybe a car gets that. crushed, and on the day of the dead, the car comes back as a spirit and kills everyone. I feel like like not only has Stephen King already turned that into a book, but he's done it like three times. Right when I said it. (laughs) So so that's something. But uh, that's all I've got this week for Silent Night, Deadly Night 1 and 2. Well, well, we... For two, we do have to mention the car stunt. Uh, the car stunt. Yeah. So after he shoots the garbage guy, garbage then, there's a, then there's a car coming toward him. So he starts shooting at the car. Yes. And then it, it he shoots the radiator. 
which makes the car go up on two wheels or whatever. Yeah. But then the car is up on two wheels and drives past him in a long shot. Yes. And you could see for a second, he had a fucking duck. <laughs> that car was right the fuck next to him. Yeah. That was... Really? Like, like, if you told... If, if these people who were making a movie with 500 bucks and 45 books of H&S green stamps. Yeah. And they told me that you they were going to do this car stunt. And I had to stand there in the car. No, that's where I'm walking off. Yeah. The fuck you it, are. You're going to get me killed. Me. You don't know it, what you're doing. <laughs> it reminds me of the beginning of uh, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Yeah. When they're able, they they're able to use a helicopter for this opening scene, but they can only do one take. And it, as it just so happens, in that one take, the L, the the helicopter crashes, so they just use it. Yeah. Then the helicopter crashes, and then they walk out of it going, "Whoo! Glad we survived that." Anyway. <laughs> they, just, they just keep the horrible thing in the movie because it's like, hey, we had one take. This is what happened. Fuck it. Yeah, yeah. But that Use is about it. it. What else? I mean, I mean, there was no movie here, so there's nothing yeah, to it's talk not about with, with this second part. Yeah, we've pretty Silent much just told the it. entire second part. Yeah. Yeah. But I never saw any of the other Silent Night, Deadly Nights. I saw the first one a couple of times, probably when I was too young, and then the second one, because Garbage Day. But I've never seen any of the other ones, and I don't think I need to. No. No. Yeah. But this, if the, anything, the I might one, see it's just, the... it's just like, oh, look, it's a white guy in a neighborhood shooting people. Yeah. It's not even really Santa-related anymore. Yeah, and and it's like, well, of course there's a white guy in the neighborhood shooting people. That's what, That's what white guys do. <laughs> yup. Yeah. I am really high right now. Uh, so, that's all I've got this week. Next week is the last episode of 2021, and we're going out the way we always do with, I believe, our 97th <coughs> annual discussion of the greatest movie of all time, Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny. Uh, a Steven Spielberg production. A fun fact, the script was written by Nelson Mandela in prison. Yes. So, it's a big deal. Originally, uh... Uh, what's his name? Donald Sutherland wanted to star in it as the the ice cream bunny. But, yeah. But Barry Mahon said no. Yeah. Not gonna happen. The entire soundtrack is by Pink Floyd, but they did it under a different name. Yes, they so did as, it a Soft White Underbelly. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, it filmed in downtown Pirate Land. A theme yes. park not many people remember. That's next week, and I'm excited to once again Okay, discuss. wait. One question, though. Jack yes. and the Beanstalk or Thumbelina? Yeah, let's do the Thumbelina. I feel like we did Jack and the Beanstalk last year. Yeah. I think we did that a couple of years in a row, so let's, let's do the yeah. Thumbelina again. Yeah, we're doing the, the Thumbelina. Uh, there are two different... The one that I like? No. There are two different versions yeah. of Santa Claus, of Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny. One that has one movie inside of it and one that has a different movie inside of it. And in the beginning, we always did the version with Thumbelina until finally I think Bunny found the version with Jack and the Beanstalk. 
And then we've done that a couple of years. Now we're going back to Thumbelina, which is longer. Yes. But I think there's more going on with Thumbelina than Jack and the Beast. <coughs> but anyway, I don't know. We'll figure that out next week. But now that I'm looking back at this week, oh, man, the highs, the lows, the ups, the downs. Gene Siskel is a piece of shit. Uh, Together, Together, starring Patty Harrison. And uh, uh, I failed to attempt. Thank you. I, I got to say, I think this has been a, a pretty good episode, a fairly good episode, somewhat good Pretty darn damn good. good. I, damn good. It's been a damn good episode. It's okay. been a damn good episode. Okay, good. I was going to say that, but I didn't... I didn't. I feel like you're the person who decides whether it's damn good or not damn good. And, you know, I don't want to impose... But, yes, I concur with your assessment, good sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am really high. And on behalf <laughs> of Natasha, Eleanor, Maxwell, Mal, and everyone else, I just want to say thanks for listening. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. <laughs> and you do show off with some poopy Thank you, Bella. A new Super Mario, do, 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 do. and you other mothers. And you other mothers. That's nice. I like that. Okay. Uh, do 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 do